from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2020, virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and ecosystem partners. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman and this is theCUBE coverage of KubeCon Cloud Native Con 2020 in Europe, the virtual edition. And you've reached the final stage. This is our, our, our last interview. So hopefully learned a lot talking to the CNCF members. We've had a few great practitioners, uh, of, of course, some of the important vendors and, and startups in the space. Uh, and when we talk about what's happening in this, this cloud native space, one of, the, one of the things that gets bandied about a lot is scale. What does that mean? You know, when it first rolled out, of course, there, there is only one Google out there and only a handful of true hyperscalers, but there absolutely are some companies that really need scale, performance, global, and so happy to bring in, he's the final boss, uh, it, it is Alexandre McLean. He's a technical architect at Ubisoft, and, and yes, I do have a little bit of background in gaming, but here is someone that is helping enable you know, one of the largest gaming companies in the globe. So Alexandre, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for the invitation, happy to be here. All right, so you're, you're no novice to this uh, ecosystem. Uh, I know you and I have both been at many of the, the Docker cons, the Cube cons over the years. So if you could just give our audience a little bit of your background and what is your team responsible for uh, at Ubisoft? Okay, sure. So uh, I am part of the one of the IT teams inside Ubisoft. So we're responsible mainly to provide uh, cloud computing resources and Kubernetes infrastructure for the whole company. So our games, and if you want to know more, well, basically I've been I've been leading the Kubernetes initiative the past few years right now. So we started the journey maybe in 2016. Uh, we're already already pretty busy, you know, working on the growth for the cloud. Uh, the cloud initiative it's on Ubisoft for the growth of the expansion in different data centers and supporting the needs of the different teams and development teams inside Ubisoft. And one thing we wanted to do back then was really to uh, enable and accelerate the adoption of cloud native, uh, the cloud native mindset and cloud native architecture. So what we did back then is did uh, we did a short analysis of our different technologies that was available at the time, and we did decided to jump full ahead on Kubernetes and make this as the foundation uh, for the different workloads, container workloads that will be, that will enable uh, drive ad of adoption inside Ubisoft to grow and boost the, the productivity of uh, many teams. All right, I, I'm really glad you brought up that cloud native mindset. If you could just, up level it a little bit for you know the business leaders out there. They they hear about you know Kubernetes and, and they won't know how to spell it. They they hear something like a cloud native mindset and they say you know I don't understand what does this mean for our business. So what architecturally are you doing and what does that mean uh, for you know your, your your games and ultimately your end users. Yeah, so I would say that basically, I mean, if you want to have a cloud native, uh, cloud -native architecture, really want to make your application, first of all, very portable, very easy to deploy and manageable, and at the same time, very res resilient to failure. So you want to make sure that your application, once it's deployed, that it's highly resilient uh, to failure, that it was built for failures, and that you can uh, manage the, the product and the service uh, to meet the expectation of uh, the, either the gamers or the service owners, basically. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, <laughs> here in 2020, uh, we, we see the ripple effects of what the global pandemic has. I have to imagine that from a gaming standpoint, uh, that has had an impact. So maybe if we can use that as an analogy, if, if, it, if it's valid from your standpoint, um, I have to imagine more people are using it. What did this mean to your infrastructure? How were you ready from an IT's perspective uh, to uh, support that you know, increased usage uh, kind of rippling around the globe as, as more people are home all the time? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I guess, I mean, we, we, we really have like two kind of, I would say, audience inside Ubisoft uh, in the IT team that, uh, that I serve. So we have the people who are building the softwares and the applications to help the developers to, uh, I mean, the game developers in general. So we have different services, internal services and tooling that needs to be hosted somewhere. And we need to uh, enable these people and these teams to have a way to, the, to, to, to manage your applications efficiently. And the other side we are looking at right now, I mean, we the game server and the game industry is really, I, I think there's a shift right now in the way that, a shift of paradigm of the way that you're going to manage 
uh, the game servers in the future. And I would say that back then there was a lot of in-house tooling, things that were really, I mean, um, proprietary to each gaming uh, company. But right now, uh, what we wanted to do in the past few years, we worked, for instance, on a solution called Hagone. So we were uh, involved in the beginning to design this kind of next-gen game server, dedicated server hosting infrastructure that was all built around Kubernetes. So in the future, we, we already started to work on that. And the next gen of games are going to be definitely hosted on top of Kubernetes, which is going to enable a lot more uh, efficiency of uh, resource usage. And uh, at the same time, we'd say manageability and operability uh, about all these, um, all these services. Because I, I think that one key thing about uh, cloud native and Kubernetes is that once you know Kubernetes, I mean, basically, it's very easy to uh, onboard new people in the team, in the project, because they, they know what is Kubernetes and how to operate it. So it will be much more efficient in the future for all the workloads that we have internally and the next game server uh, infrastructure as well to be a in Kubernetes. It's going to be much more easy uh, to standardize and unify that whole stack. Well, skill sets are so critically important, uh, and it's it's great to hear you say that onboarding somebody uh, in, in Kubernetes uh, is, is easier than it might have been a, a couple of years ago. If you could bring us inside a little bit, you know, what, what's your stack look like? You know, when you know, can you say what cloud or cloud you use um, when it comes to Kubernetes? You know, what what are the key tool tools that you're using and and, and partners that you have? Yeah, sure. So early on, I would say um, almost 10 years ago, we really started to focus on having on-prem cloud infrastructure and the technology that we chose back then was OpenStack. So we have a large footprint of uh, OpenStack cloud install installed internally and different data centers all around the world. So people and different teams and uh, anyone at Ubisoft can easily have uh, computers or compute resources available for them. And with Kubernetes, we uh, initially we wanted to have, you know, um, to, to make Kubernetes a commodity. We wanted to have people be very, uh, I mean, in a position to easily experiment uh, new things, new applications on top of Kubernetes. And for that, we decided to go with Rancher. So Rancher is an open source solution being made by Rancher Labs. And we uh, initially, although we started to build an in-house solution uh, the first year, because we talked back then, the landscape was quite different and we thought it was the best choice for us to do. But we realized shortly after, I mean, when Rancher uh, 2.2 came out, I think it was in uh, something like April 2018, uh, that we will benefit a lot to go with this kind of solution, which was open source. There was a lot of traction behind it. And it will enable us to, uh, I mean, accelerate, accelerate the adoption of uh, Kubernetes and Cloud Native in general much more faster than the you know, solutions that we had built at that time. So. We went uh, with Rancher, and right now we have, I would say, I mean, we have maybe 10 data centers with the cloud installed on top of it. Much more data centers are going to grow in the next uh, couple of months and years. And we have over two, 200 clusters uh, and 1,000 nodes that are managed by Rancher. And people can just deploy on demand uh, their own Kubernetes cluster and get started with it if they want to. Okay, so so if I heard you right, it, it's Rancher on top of the OpenStack solutions in your data centers. Um, yes. It, it, you talk about how many clusters you have. Um, you know, what's the state of managing those environments? You said you're using Rancher. That's one of the things we've seen a lot of discussion over the last couple of years. Is you know went from managing containers to managing you know a pod or a cluster to now multi clusters around multi sites. You know, what's the maturity today? Uh, anything that you're looking for that would make your life easier uh, to, to to manage such a uh, such such a broad environment? Yeah, well, uh, I would say that one of the drawback, I mean, when we enabled that solution with Rancher with DEC, I mean, the ease of use of launching and provisioning new clusters is that right now we have a lot of clusters, maybe too many, because we try to consolidate. I mean, the next uh, the next logical step for us is we try to consolidate the workloads maybe as much as possible and see if there's really a need for people to have their own dedicated cluster for them. And initially, there was a lot of demand for that because people basically they came to us and they said, you know, we want to use Kubernetes. And what we want to do is we want to have full administrative access to it. We want to be able to do whatever we want with it, upgrade it at our home pace. 
And I want I don't want have to, I don't want to have any neighbor on it. I want to be completely isolated in terms of compute resources. So we said, all right, we're going to make a solution that's going to provision new clusters on demand for everyone. And Rancher solves that need very well. But now, after a while, we some people and we, especially as an IT provider and operator, we realized that you know maybe people don't have to be completely alone on the cluster. Maybe to, we should try to consolidate that a little bit. So we're trying to migrate workloads from certain services and tooling and say maybe you can instead of running your own cluster you can use this one that is going to be shared and there will be a team dedicated i mean dedicated to support and operate this cluster for you because we want to in the end we want to offload the burden of infrastructure and kubernetes although it's i mean it, it brings a lot of abstraction and simplicity you still have to manage your cluster in the end so we'd rather have people focus on the application side than on the Kubernetes infrastructure side. So we're, we, will, we will start uh, a path of maybe try to consolidate the different workloads and see if we can uh, reduce the amount of clusters that we have. And also to unify the way that people are using uh, the different providers, because although we have a huge open, uh, open stack cloud offering internally on-prem, there are still people who need to uh, use GKE or AKS and cloud external cloud providers. So for these people, some of them are not using really Rancher, although it's possible with Rancher, they're just directly using the providers. But what we want to do is try to unify the, the way that you're going to get access to this cluster, try to make a central governance model for people to uh, to pass through a central team to get access and provision the cluster so they will be standardized and we will be able to add more maybe security policies and compliance and rules and everything so that, that the cluster will be created in certain ways and not too much fragmented as they are today. Yeah, that, 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 that's ultimately what I was, uh, was, was trying to understand is uh, most customers I talk to, it, they have hybrid environments, they use multiple clouds. If you're using Kubernetes, you know, how do you get your, your arms around that? So um, it, I'd love to get your viewpoint just because you've been involved since uh, kind of the early Kubernetes days. You know, what's, what's better now than it was a few years ago? I, you know, I heard you say that you, you looked at uh, possibly you know, creating a solution to, to yourself. So, a company like Rancher helps simplify things. So when, when you look at the maturity, you know, how happy are you with what you have now? And are there any things that you say, boy, I'd, I'd love my team to not have to worry about this. Um, you know, maybe the industry as a whole would be able to you know, standardize or make things simpler. Well, um, you know, when we started to, to use Rancher, maybe there were a couple of things that we wanted to simplify for the users because uh, what Rancher does is essentially is that yeah, there's a lot of configuration options. It's very flexible because it supports many providers. So the first few things, the first few things that we did was try to simplify the user experience. So we 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 extend we 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 modified Rancher in certain ways to make it simpler to be consumed. And although the experience is much more simpler than it was, uh, let's say, two years ago when we started, we still want to to simplify it even further. We want to ideally uh, provide a fully managed experience so people don't even have to worry about the control plane components uh, that is currently being deployed with their Kubernetes cluster. So we want to remove that away from them so they will be, uh, once again, fully focused, uh, solely focused on the application side of development. And I think one other aspect that we need to maybe improve in the future is that when you want to deploy your application and make it uh, resilient and ge geographically distributed, then uh, you need to manage multiple clusters and you need to deploy your applications on top of multiple clusters. So the whole multi-cluster aspect of things like, how do I deploy my application from a version? How do I make it like consistent between the different clusters that where it needs to be deployed? How do I make service discovery possible? How do I mesh everything, all the application together to make sure that it's easy to operate, it's easy for the developers and that it's resilient in the end. So we will uh, start to look at the, I mean, the multi-cluster, multi-region aspect for Kubernetes because that's a big challenge to us. All right, well, well Alexandre, I want, want to shift for a second. Let's talk about the, the, the conference, KubeCon, Cloud Native Con. Obviously it's virtual this year, so there is a little bit of shift, but you know, you've attended many of these in the past. What, uh, what, what are there projects that you're interested in learning more? Are, are, are there you know, peers of yours that you're looking to collaborate with? Uh, what have you seen in the past that, that you're hoping you still get uh, from a virtual event like we have this year? 
Um, well, you know, I think that uh, just, it, it has become so big, it's hard to keep up with everything that's happening at the same time, you know, nowadays. But uh, things that we're looking at really is maybe like, um, I, I think that there's maybe uh, in terms of service mesh, there are a lot of technologies. I think it's maturing uh, slowly. So we'll, have, we'll all start to have a look about what, what is the most, uh, uh, the best fit for us and the, the, the use cases that we have. And some people probably are using Kubernetes and some, some other people are using you know more traditional stacks. So we try to bridge that together and see what's possible to, to migrate the existing workloads from the tr traditional uh, cloud VMs and cloud applications toward Kubernetes and everything. So maybe try to see how it's possible to bridge that path and migrate gradually for the users that we have. And other things in general, I think that it will be very interesting to see how the, the whole DevSecOps uh, evolve, uh, ev uh, I mean, um, evaluate right now. and see uh, how we can try to add conformance and compliance uh, rules to different clusters that we have to manage to make sure that uh, it's no longer like this ad hoc matter of I want to create a cluster, I get access to it. Uh, we, we need to need to centralize the governance, we need to centralize the, the rules of how everything's going to be managed in the end and make sure that security is a big aspect to it. So make sure that there's no vulnerabilities and everything's be, being audited and um, Especially for the game servers, is going to be uh, a big, a big, a big factor for us. So we definitely are interested into all the security discussions that's happening right now. All right, no, no shortage of uh, lots of information, Alexandre. By the way, that there's no way that anybody can keep up on everything that's happening in this very robust community. But thank you so much for share, sharing your journey. Uh, it, it's always great to hear from the practitioner. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Awesome. All Bye. Right. And thank you for joining us uh, for all the coverage. Be sure to go to thecube.net. You can see not only all the interviews from this show, uh, you can go search, find previous shows, as well as see what events we will be at, of course, right now, all virtually. So I'm Stu Miniman, and thank you, as always, for watching The Cube. <laughs>